Welcome to the opening of the 2020 Singapore Literature Festival in New York City. My name is Ji Leong Ko, and I'm the founder and organizer of Singapore Unbound and your host tonight. I'm wearing a gray shirt and sitting in my home office with a shelf of books behind me. My preferred pronouns are he, him. Organized by the NYC-based literary nonprofit Singapore Unbound, the Singapore Literature Festival brings together Singaporean and American authors and audiences for readings and discussions. Appropriately, the festival theme this year is the politics of hope. We acknowledge gratefully the sponsorship of Ethos Books and many private champions, as well as the support of our co-presenters, New Narrative, The Evergreen Review, Asia Society, Adelphi University's MFA program and soapbox series, NYU English Department's Postcolonial Race and Diaspora Studies Colloquium, the Southeast Asian Studies program at the University of California, Riverside, and Books Actually. Tonight, we will hear from our keynote speaker, PJ Thumb, on the topic, Is There Hope for Democracy? After his talk, PJ will field questions from the audience. Our co-presenter for this event is NYU English Department's Post-Colonial Race and Diaspora Studies Colloquium. But first, let me introduce you to our event moderator, Ginny Kim Watson. Ginny Kim Watson is an Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at New York University. She is a co-convener of NYU's Postcolonial Race and Diaspora Studies Colloquium. Her new book, Cold War Reckonings, Authoritarianism and the Genres of Decolonization is forthcoming from Fordham University Press in spring 2021. Please welcome Ginny. Before I go, I'll ask all our speakers to speak slowly and clearly so that a closed captioner can capture what you say. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much, Chi. And it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to see so many people joining us this evening. My name is Ginny Kim Watson. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, her. And I am sitting here in my living room in Manhattan I'm wearing a, a blue t-shirt and a red jacket. Um, and I'm so thrilled to be here to introduce and moderate our opening address. So let me just spend a minute or two introducing our distinguished speaker. Thumping Jin is a historian of Malaya and a campaigner for democracy, human rights and freedom of expression in Southeast Asia. His historical work centers on the legacy of colonialism in Southeast Asia. And he's the founding director uh, and managing director of New Narrative and visiting fellow at Hartford College, University of Oxford. He's also a Rhodes Scholar, a Commonwealth Scholar, an Olympic athlete, and the only Singaporean to swim the English Channel. Uh, so welcome PJ. Hello, hi, good morning, or good evening, rather, as, as it were. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much for, for getting up early. Uh, we know it's, it's early in Singapore. Um, so PJ has pre-recorded his talk, so we're going to play that now. And it's about 20 minutes long, and then we're going to come back for a live Q&A. Um, and just before we, we start the, uh, the video, I just want to let you know if you if you want to only see the the video uh, and nobody else, not not another little box in the corner. Um, if you go up to the right hand corner of the Zoom screen um, and click Standard on the View Options, uh, then you'll just get the 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 screen of the video. But that's only for the newest version of Zoom. Otherwise, you're going to have a small box with me in it. Um, all right. Um, so, and hello, we'll everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is PJ Thumb. I'm wearing a green batik shirt 
because today, 2nd October, is Hari Batik, and I'm standing in front of a pre-colonial map of Southeast Asia. My pronouns are he, him. I want to first thank G and the organizers of the Singapore Literature Festival in New York City for inviting me to speak to all of you today, and I want to thank all of you for joining me. Today, we live in a world governed by three major ideologies which are breaking down. Neoliberal capitalism, liberal or more accurately illiberal democracy, and nationalism, specifically the nation state as its political expression. And I'm going to talk in particular about the intersection of the last two and the role that we as writers, artists and academics can play in building a better world. The American diplomat Richard Holbrook, on the eve of elections, which were supposed to restore democracy in Bosnia in September 1996, asked, suppose the elections are free and fair. What if those elected are racists, fascists, separatists? And this is the problem we face. Around the world, we see that supposedly free and fair elections are producing racists, fascists, and xenophobes. The question is, why? If this is what democracy produces, is there hope for democracy? Since this is the Singapore Literature Festival, I want to explain this by telling you a story about Singapore. It's a story that many of you might be familiar with and some of you might actually have lived through. It's about our reunification with the rest of Malaya in 1963 and what this tells us about democracy and how and why people vote. It's hard to understand right now, but the idea of Singapore as a nation state is a very, very recent one. Until 1957, there was no real distinction between Singapore and the rest of Malaya. Administratively, there had been three different arrangements for British Malaya, and Singapore was governed with Penang and Malacca as the straight settlements. But for the people of Malaya, Malaya stretched from Singapore all the way to Perlis and even to the Malay states that were formerly part of southern Thailand. Think of how the People's Action Party in Singapore has divided Singapore into these nonsensical group representative constituencies, such as to, to the result that 6th Avenue is in Tanjung Paga GRC or Serangoon is in Marine Parade GRC. Maybe to the administrators it makes sense, but to us, there's only one government and there's no real impact on our day-to-day -day lives as we move around. And that's how people on the ground experienced Malaya back then. Federated, and unfederated, Malay states, straight settlements, whatever, it's one country. There were no borders. Again, this may be hard for us to understand. For most of human history, we've lived in a world of open borders. Permanent border control with passports and walls and security is really an invention of the 20th century. And for most of history, security was focused on cities, not countries. In Malaya, until 1946 and even till 1957, there was no real restriction of movement over the causeway the way we understand and experience it today. And Malayans tended to travel to Singapore in particular. Singapore was the New York of Malaya, of the Malay world, the big city where Malayans would go to find work. Singaporeans had family back in Malaya, in Ipoh, in Taiping, in Kuala Lumpur. We were the shining jewel of the Malay world. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So how people experienced and imagined their home, their country, their identity was very different to how we see it today. And after the partition of Malaya in 1946 under the Malayan Union, and especially after the independence of the Federation of Malaya in 1957, Singaporeans wanted reunification with the rest of their country, with their families on the other side of the border. And so began the campaign that culminated in merger in 1963. Now, the merger campaign of 61 to 63 is really complicated, but the short version is that Lee Kuan Yew rushed into merger because he was on the verge of losing the next elections due in 63, and he wanted something he could deliver to the electorate and also use as a wedge issue on which he could defeat his opponents. Reunification was so popular and so strongly felt it was perfect for him to manipulate. In order to achieve merger, he was forced to negotiate a form of merger which was highly flawed. 
Singaporeans would be unequal citizens of the new Malaysia. We were politically quarantined in Singapore, underrepresented in the Dewan Rakyat, and lived separate political lives within Malaysia. In exchange, we had concessions in labour rights, education, and also there was no real agreement on financial and economic arrangements. Now, the opposition Barisan Socialists pointed out that rationally, the form of merger made no sense. Imagine if you and your family lived together in one house, but you could only be treated as a member of the family when you are in your bedroom. The moment you leave your bedroom, you are treated as a foreigner within the house. In exchange, you have greater freedom in your own bedroom compared to everyone else in the house. You can run a shop in your bedroom. You can serve people through your bedroom window. But you still have to pay for your share of all the household bills and utilities and bear responsibility for the whole house. But when the house votes on what to do, you count for only 62% of a full vote. And you will forever be a foreigner outside of your bedroom. So in the short term, maybe you can put up with it. But in the long term, such a living arrangement would never work. But that was what the PAP proposed. And the Singapore public weren't stupid. They knew this was a bad deal. A Gallup poll in Tanjong Paga, run by a committee headed by Tommy Ko, yes, that Tommy Ko, found that 90% of the respondents against, were against the PAP's proposed form of merger. Tommy Ko is still alive, you can ask him about this poll. But when the PAP then called for a referendum on merger, they won in a landslide. 70% voted for the PAP's option, while 25% cast blank votes. So here's the question. Why did the PAP win the referendum on merger so decisively, even though the people recognised that the choices in front of them were all deeply flawed? Why did democracy fail to produce an outcome which was actually representative of what the people wanted? And this brings us back to the question about democracy. Part of understanding the outcome is understanding that the whole system was rigged. The parliamentary process marginalised opposition voices. The referendum had no option to vote no. The way the vote was run was very biased. The PAP monopolised the media coverage. All the ways many elections today are problematic, which you are definitely familiar with. And the problem is that we often mistake voting for democracy. Elections are a mechanism through which we can achieve democracy, but it is not democracy itself. Democracy includes rule of law, a separation of powers, the protection of basic liberties of freedom of speech, assembly, religion, association, and so on. Democracy includes values and norms of fairness and justice. And when those values and norms are violated, even by freely and fairly elected leaders, it ceases to be a democracy. Democracy ends. One marker of a democracy, I suggest, is when people care more that the process through which decisions being made are fair and just than the actual outcomes of the decision. All of this was absent in the referendum. So I don't think any of this first point is controversial, as the importance to democracy of the ideas of classical liberalism have been understood for a long time now, but it's important to remember. Okay, but people then could still have cast blank votes. Why did they end up voting for the PAP's option instead of blank votes? And to understand this, I want to focus on another important aspect of that vote, that of nationalism, of identity, and what that means for us today. To understand this, let me reframe the story you just heard in the context of the 20th century and in particular the concept of the nation-state. The concept of the nation-state arose out of the wreckage of World War I as the great European land empires, Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, were torn apart. And this idea of the nation-state was powerfully liberating by articulating the idea that people should govern themselves. But how do we group people? Well, if everyone has a nationality, if they belong to a nation, and if nations should be sovereign and self-governing, then naturally each nation should have its own state. 
The problem, of course, is that it's impossible for every nation to neatly map on to every state and vice versa. And over time, autocrats realized that monopolizing control of the definition of the nation gave them power over the state and allowed them to target their enemies within the state as not part of the nation. And then from there, a short step to they are anti-national. And from there, it's a short step to saying they're not just a threat to the nation state, but we need to act against them with extreme prejudice, against all enemies with extreme prejudice, real or perceived. So the nation state ideal powers the breakup of empires and the liberation of colonies, which then form new states throughout the 20th century. But at the same time, because of this, we also get horrors like genocide. Who belongs to the nation? Who does not? The Rohingya, the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, the Papuans. What nation do they belong to? What state do they belong to? What happens if their self-definition of their own identity is different from the state government's definition of their identity? What happens if my definition of my own identity is different from my government's? In Singapore, we see people who disagree with the government being tarred as anti-national, as traitors, on the most spurious grounds. People like me, just because we disagree with the government. This is the Janus face of the nation-state paradigm. It is simultaneously powerfully liberating and powerfully oppressing. From the fall of the Roman Republic to the beginning of the 20th century, the empire was the default mode of political organization. But within a few decades, by the late 1960s, we were a world of nation-states. And Singapore was no different. From the moment we understood that we were going to be an independent country, we understood it through the paradigm of the nation-state and the questions immediately arose. What nation? Whose nation? And the answer overwhelmingly came back. The Malayan nation. We are Malayan. But what does it then mean to be Malayan? And this was the central problem, the central contested issue. And the leaders of the alliance government in Kuala Lumpur had a very different meaning of Malayan than most Singaporeans. Heck, the leaders of UMNO in Kuala Lumpur had a different meaning of Malayan from many Singaporean Malays, many of whom envisioned a republic either on par with Indonesia or even rejoining Indonesia to reunite the Malay world and rejecting colonial boundaries. But what was never in doubt for most of our forebears was that they were Malayan. And that is why we voted for reunification, for merger with Malaya, because we were Malayan. But then why vote for a flawed version? Well, studies have shown that people don't vote purely on the basis of rational self-interest. I mean, they can't. There's just too many conflicting details. Life is complicated. People don't vote on the basis of who the best candidate is, or even usually on the basis of a single issue. All of these things matter. But when you walk into a polling station, you only have a limited set of choices in front of you, and no one agrees with every policy that a party puts out. So what studies have shown is that all of this ultimately is wrapped up in identity. Voters vote as much to affirm their own identity as to make a choice about party and policy. So this helps us understand why people voted for merger, even though they were against the exact form of merger. For them, it was an affirmation of an identity as Malayan, and they could not imagine themselves as anything else, and they voted for a flawed deal because it was the best option that affirmed that identity. And the PAP and Alliance governments both said it was the only realistic option for reunification. It was a flawed deal or no deal. They could not imagine themselves as anything else. They were Malayan. But today, many people cannot imagine Singapore having different borders, or indeed, I'd say, I'd guess that most people cannot imagine their national borders as anything other than what exists today. But we've seen throughout history that national borders are negotiated and constructed, and so too is national identity constructed and collectively imagined. There is no objective reality to national identity the way, say, a rock is a rock, right? A rock is a rock objectively, 
But tomorrow, if every Singaporean decided we were not Singaporean, but a different nationality, call it Earthican, then we would be Earthican and no one would know what a Singaporean was. This is the central contradiction of the world today, that we organize ourselves politically on the basis of the nation state, which is predicated on the nation, which is entirely imaginary and subjective. And that gives immense power to those who control that identity. The people who can control the identity of the nation can control the state. That's why the fundamental political contest, I think, of our modern world is not about policies. It's actually about identity. Because today, a vast amount of political power comes from being able to define and control national identity. This is a consequence of over a century of the nation state ideal. Voting has become very tribal. Voters vote and feel entirely justified in voting on the basis of a very narrow identity that they identify with, even if it then leads to outcomes which may not be rationally in their interest. And this then brings into power leaders who use this fear of the other and exclusionary nationalism to win power. Leaders like Trump and Orban, or indeed Mahathir and Muhyiddin, are natural products of our historical trajectory. They're not aberrations or exceptions. They stoke fears of people who do not fit in with their national identity, especially minorities and migrants. They attach values which support their position to the national identity and attack values which don't support their position as anti-national. So ironically, nationalism, which enabled so much liberation by decolonization, is now a primary justification for oppression and exclusion within the nation states, and it has led our world to being more divided. And the toxicity of much nationalist rhetoric and the politics of fear means that a wide range of issues are now tied to nationalism. Migrants, the dilution of one's culture, moral decay, the loss of economic livelihood, and politicians find it far easier to mobilize voters on the basis of nationalism and fear. So all these important issues become tied to this conception of the nation. And once they win, they can say they have a mandate to ignore the values and norms of democracy and overturn the structures and institutions which protect and promote democracy because having won the vote, they can claim a democratic mandate to pursue the realization of that identity. So when Obama says vote, he's not wrong, but I don't think he's completely right. He's focus focusing on the mechanics, but not the values. And I think he's setting up the wrong expectations. Voting is necessary, but it will never be enough. For us, those who want to fight for democracy, the real battle, I think, is on three levels. First, promoting the values that underpin democracy. Rule of law, a separation of powers, freedom of speech, assembly, religion, association, and so on. Promoting the means, not the ends. Understanding that process is more important than outcome. Without these values, democracy would not exist. Second, promoting alternative conceptions of the nation. Our fight is to push back against narrow, exclusionary views of the nation and define identity, national identity, as incorporating ideals of fairness and justice and respect for the individual. Authoritarian leaders love to tie obedience to national identity. They say things like, in our nation, we value society above the individual. These are Asian values, not Western values. It's all hypocrisy, of course. As these people were the same ones who promoted individual rights when we were still colonies, but the moment they got in power, suddenly they embraced the values of their former colonial master and called those values Asian values. But there is a third level, and we have to ask ourselves, can we ever truly escape toxic nationalism as long as we continue organizing ourselves as nation states? So our third challenge is to reconsider the concept of the nation state itself and reimagine better ways of organizing ourselves politically that protect all individuals and treat all individuals with dignity and respect. And this is where we, as artists, writers, thinkers, philosophers, academics, this is where we come in. 
we need to imagine a better world. But just imagining is not enough. We need to then inspire people to believe that that better world is possible. But inspiring them is not enough. We need to then convince people to emotionally identify with this better world and incorporate it into their identity so that it becomes as natural to all of us as breathing. I, I don't just believe this, I'm actually building a company to carry this out in Southeast Asia. It's called New Narrative. Is there any hope for democracy? Yes. It lies in all of us to imagine, inspire, and incorporate a better world into our lives. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, PJ, for that uh, incredibly thought-provoking presentation. That was really brilliant. Um, and, and so apt for us here in the US as we are on the eve of election, which, which can only be described in terms of toxic nationalism, as, as you've just uh, explained it. Um, so thank you again. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, and I invite everyone else while I'm doing that um, to think of your own questions and please put them in the chat and then um, I will um, uh, read out the questions uh, from the chat to ask PJ. But I have one question to get us started. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning a topic that you then quickly said you weren't going to talk about, which is neoliberal capitalism in this large equation. Um, you spoke so eloquently and convincingly about this Janus face nature of the nation state and the political problems it gets us into. I'm also wondering about our particular moment of turbocharged neoliberalism. We've seen you know, the, uh, the extraordinary inequalities revealed by the coronavirus pandemic. And it's an economic system which we could say has its own set of values and norms, the freedom of the market over everything else, privatization, individualism, depoliticization. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very subtle or nuanced question, but I'd love to hear you say more about to what extent are some of our problems of democracy, problems of neoliberalism and capitalism? Wow, um, okay. Uh, thanks, Ginny. You you don't ask uh, small questions. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay, that's a massive uh, question, and I don't I don't know if I can answer that in um, in a short answer. Um, I, I think how I put it is that uh, neoliberal capitalism is a system which. Um, is extremely good at producing wealth, uh, producing capital. Uh, and the mistake that we've made is to think that a system designed to govern our economic lives uh, can, should, or has um, significant benefits in governing our political and social lives. Um, and so I think what, uh, we need to do is decouple um, neoliberalism from the non-economic economic aspects of our lives first, and to rethink, um, you know, as I said at the beginning, how we uh, organize ourselves on in three different ways, politically, in terms of um, we we did, you know organize ourselves in terms of liberal democracy, but what exactly is that, and how do we do that, um, and then socially in terms of the nation and um, and then economically in terms of neoliberal capitalism. And there's, uh, as you know, um, you know, a fundamentally normative basis to neo -ca uh, neoliberal capitalism, um, which kind of assumes that the market is uh, not just all powerful, but um, can produce the most accurate outcomes um, it produces the most efficient outcomes. Um, and again, right, we need to move away from that, especially when thinking about um, our non-economic lives. Um, and then with our economic lives, I think we need to recenter the human being and the dignity of the human 
uh, of, of the individual. Um, when we think about um, how we organize uh, ourselves economically. I mean, the, the marvelous thing about neoliberal capitalism is it's probably created the most wealth in uh, all of human history, right? It's really unlocked um, the ability to create massive wealth. But uh, as we've seen, that wealth has accrued very much to um, elites, to people who already have wealth. Um, it's massively increased inequality. So any future form of neo, of, sorry, of, of organization of economic lives, I think also has to take into account uh, justice and uh, equity, uh, equality, um, and most of all, uh, you know, uh, respect for respect for the individual and for fundamental human rights. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my my short answer. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you, PJ. That was such an unfair question, um, but that was a. <laughs> uh, and we have a um, a question from an audience member. It's from Manish Melwani. Great to hear. Well, I can't hear or see you, Manish, but great to know you're here. Um, his question is: Any idea what these new forms of political organization might look like, especially given present trends such as social media? irreversal climate change and so on. So another easy question for you. <laughs> oh boy. Um, the, the, again, I, I, I hesitate to answer, um, you know, to, to give an answer to the, own, to, to the problem I've just proposed. Um, partly because um, at least what I've seen around the world is that there is too much desire for other people to come along and solve problems for us. You know, uh, we see this a lot in Asia, uh, where we went from uh, colonial governments, uh, where where power was concentrated in a, a tiny foreign elite straight to post-independent governments where power was concentrated in a local elite. Um, and we haven't really built up all the other things necessary for democracy, um, which include the, the distribution of power more widely, the separation of powers and, the, um, and all the other things I mentioned, rule of law, fundamental freedoms. Um, so I think what I encourage, and when I get asked with this question, what I encourage is actually for people to start practicing democracy, and in particular, start practicing politics. And through that, we will be able to arrive at a new form of political organization that is um, suitable uh, for the local context, you know, and it's another thing I believe democracy has to evolve out of a local context. It can't be imposed, right? I think we've seen enough of attempts to impose democracy. They don't work. Um, people need to figure it out for ourselves, um, and it has to evolve out of local political organization. So, you know, again, this is something I'm trying to do a new narrative where we try and teach people uh, basic skills about political organizing, uh, about creating basic political, simple political change, positive change in your communities. Throughout human history, um, creating change has followed the same basic pattern. It's actually very straightforward, which is organize people, get people together, uh, inspire them, talk about a problem, exchange views, agree, a plan and and that's it that's political change right every basic unit of the uh, of politics is fundamentally a group of people who agree on a plan whether it's political parties or trade unions you know or uh, lobby groups or uh, ngos um, and i think out of a lot of people participating in politics and pushing for change you then can slowly evolve a system which works and uh, is more sustainable, uh, is more uh, 
you know, having grown out of the local circumstance is more respectful of that. Um, and I think that then creates a sustainable solution. Um, the problem, of course, is this is hard. This is difficult getting people to act, especially in this world where we're all so busy. And, you know, we mentioned neoliberalism and I mean, it's dehumanizing and it stresses us out and it causes us to uh, focus more on our economic selves rather than our uh, spiritual, political or social selves, um, you know, which is another problem with neoliberalism. But I don't see a short term solution, um, you know, and uh, advocating for revolution and imposing a new form of political organization might seem very fast and attractive. But again, we've seen that uh, revolutions around the world don't work unless people have already come up themselves with uh, a suitable alternative to the um, previous regime, right? You can you look at the Arab Spring in the example of Tunisia, which had alternatives ready and developed by the local people versus say Egypt, where you just ended up with the same system, but people being shuffled around the top. So yeah, that's my, that's my advice. Fight for the, the system, the world, uh, that you want, fight for the things that are important, organize people and help other people to fight for what they believe in, uh, fight for democracy, fight for the values, and then you'll get the system that, so it's, democracy is a practice, right, and good, a good organization, a good form of political organization arises from that practice. Thank you. Um, I there was a question about new narrative, but I think you um, already discussed what you were trying to do uh, with that organization. Um, it's a question here from CK. Why is democracy the best system? If war and carnage caused by nationalism unleashed by democracy is anything to go by, perhaps empires have done a better job in creating order and stability in the international realm. The Ottoman Turks have arguably been more tolerant of their subjects of, uh, of other ethnicities and faiths than India under the, the current BJP, for example. Um, I, I think the premise of the question is a little ahistorical because uh, we have to recognize that the Ottomans carried out massive conquests of the Middle East uh, Northern Africa um, and in you know into Eastern um, Europe, Central Asia. So I don't think it's um, it's really fair to say that uh, the Ottoman Turks, yes, they were very tolerant, but how did they come to govern such a wide range of ethnicities and faiths? Um, and you know, CK does uh, point to something interesting that um, we used to be a world of multinational empires. Um, and between, I think, the fall of the Roman Republic and the end of World War I, uh, empire was the default in human history, um, in human organ, in default form of human political organization. Um, but the fact that I think the nation state ideal um, arose and was seized so rapidly uh, and enthusiastically by so many people also shows a certain uh, desire to govern ourselves. Um, and the fact that uh, these empires broke up so rapidly, I think is also reflective of a genuine desire among peoples for self-governance and sovereignty. Um, and is India today actually any less of an empire because it pretends to be a nation state or China, right? There are, I mean, look at Kashmir. Is that really, um, you know, a place with sovereignty? Look at Tibet, look at Xinjiang. So again, just because India calls itself a nation state or China calls itself a nation state doesn't mean it's a nation state. It, could, you know, it's, it, it has a lot of the characteristics of an empire. So again, I, I, I come back to the idea that it's uh, better to have a system where, which uh, fundamentally protects human rights, the rights of the individual, and which uh, protects 
fundamental freedoms. And I call that democracy. Uh, maybe we, maybe democracy has become too much of a loaded term because there are extremely flawed democracies which have given it a bad name and which, and every, you know, authoritarian and dictator calls what they do democracy. Um, but democracy for me includes all those fundamental freedoms and protections of the individual which, you know, there's, it's the only basic unit of human society that is absolutely verifiable, right? You, you, you know, when we talk about society, it's um, this amorphous term that, again, a lot of authoritarians love to manipulate, uh, which is why I come down to the level of the individual. And to me, that's what's, that's what's important, and that's why it's the best system. Um, and I would, I would say caution, I, I would caution against... Um, looking at labels and mistaking them for the substance really the question is about the um, you know if the ottomans actually respected fundamental freedoms and individual liberties more than india under the bjp then they are more of a democracy than um, india even if india has voting and the ottomans didn't right because democracy is more than just voting or just calling yourself a democracy mm -hmm. And well, thank you. Uh, it's an interesting question from Ray Buono. Nation states, as you said, are imagined communities, but especially in these times, imaginations are controlled by elites using powerful tools of propaganda and media control, including repression and, and censorship. Compared to these powerful instruments of power, how can artists and those in opposition overcome the imbalance of access to imagination and power over imagination? I think this is such a key question for our moment. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how um, the world seems to be so inspired by Black Lives Matter. And why is that? At a time where America seems less relevant than ever, Black Lives Matter has inspired so many movements and protests around the world, including here in Singapore. Uh, but the one that I was really uh, impressed by um, and moved by was actually the West Papuans also adopting that and protesting for their freedom uh, in West Papua, which is, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, it's an uh, occupied territory, uh, a colony of Indonesia which has been fighting for sovereignty and self-determination since the 60s. Um, and I think it shows that the, there are powerful ideas out there um, and finding, if they find the right expression and the right, um, you know, if they resonate, it can overcome um, the powerful tools of propaganda and media control, which, which Ray talks about. Um, and we live in a world, I think, where arguably the, we have tools which allow us to reach out globally on a scale and on an unprecedented scale, right? I mean, witness what we're doing right now. I'm giving a talk to people around the world, uh, answering questions from someone in New York. Um, and these, these tools, I think, uh, are ways in which we can overcome the imbalance of access. Uh, and the, it's not to say the tools themselves are solution, because of course these tools can and have been misused, uh, manipulated. Uh, again, this is well documented, um, but uh, you know, a, a tool works both ways and we have these tools. And I think that um, it's up to us to use them um, and what I'm seeing all the time is just very innovative ways um, of uh, online of people um, using their, their words, their art, their music, um, images to inspire. So I think that that's, you know, we, we got to take advantage of, of these tools. Um, and I hesitate to go more on that because I, I, I don't want to... Um, 
you know, again, I'm not uh, the, I'm not an artist. Um, I, you know, I just, I can um, talk about some of the things I've seen online that are so incredibly powerfully moving and made me think. Um, but I personally wouldn't, you know, um, wouldn't uh, prescribe anything. Yeah. Uh, but again, you know, with as with new narrative, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do is create a platform for other people uh, to communicate these ideas. And, you know, new narrative has comics for a reason. We have videos, we have podcasts, uh, but comics are really, really powerful. Um, so we're, we're trying to respect all the different forms of communication, the written word, uh, but also uh, audio and visual. Um, because we recognize the power of these things and we want to create a platform for people to, to be able to get these ideas across. Yeah. Mm, that's very inspiring. There's a question here about identity from Shojia Eng. PJ, there seems to be a tension at the heart of your three levels of redress where identity has to be both individually felt but also communally and eventually institutionally defined. Are there limits to the power of identity to resolve these tensions? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'd say that um, the premise seems to be that everyone has to agree on the identity. I think uh, this this question is, is wondering, um, or at least it seems to be setting up a, a premise where it's saying that everyone has to agree to the identity. Um, and I think that what is what we need to recognize is identity is multi-layered and it is entirely possible to have identity at different levels and even conflict with each other. Uh, you know, I would def define myself as Singaporean, but also Southeast Asian, but also Malayan, you know, um, and these uh, can have things which conflict with each other. Uh, and also there's a part of me which will forever be associated with Oxford. You know, I've spent uh, like almost half my life there. You know, so these are very different identities, um, but I negotiate between them based on context and circumstance. And I think everyone does this. Um, I think that, well, again, this is something that's well, well understood. Um, and what is um, more important is the, the um, sort of classical liberal ideas that I talked about of fundamental freedoms that allow people to then feel that they have the right to their own identity uh, and that uh, and, you know, as long as it doesn't then, say, transgress or boundaries or, um, or impose that identity on others, uh, people have the right to their own identity and that is protected. And then you can negotiate that based on different circumstances, because that's society, right? That's life. Politics is negotiation in a society of how to distribute scarce resources, for example, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, I think that's um, that's what I, how I'd answer this this question if I understand it correctly. Um, identity is not fixed, and identity is not um, you know um, stable or singular, even in a single person. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here about the emergence of social democratic values. William Wells asks. Uh, something, I don't know what exactly, produced a certain assumption of social democratic values at certain times and places in history. But in lower income countries where I work, I don't see so many signs of such values emerging. Rather, bare knuckle capitalism seems more, seems more common. What lessons can we learn from the social conditions that led in the past to successful emergence of social democratic values? It's a great question for a historian. Yeah. You know, I, I think actually we, we are uh, entering a period of massive opportunity um, to actually answer that question. Um, what one example that I like to, to think about is um, Scandinavia 
And uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, it was uh, very much this uh, hierarchical conservative place. Uh, again, you know, with the caveat, I'm not an expert on Scandinavia, but my understanding of history um, is that uh, after World War II, because it, they were, it was a moment in time where social democratic forces were on the ascendancy and um, they were able to organize successfully to promote those values. Um, and then because they elected a succession of governments through, through that organizing, elected governments which then entrenched those values within the policies of the state, um, which promoted those values uh, and they developed a powerful consensus around them over generations, they actually transformed themselves from very um, conservative places into uh, the Scandinavia that we know today, which has become sort of the, almost a, a cliche perhaps about being a, a social democratic, um, you know, uh, so, yeah, social democratic societies with big emphasis on shared uh, collective responsibility for things like welfare, right? And it was a confluence of both uh, an ideology, uh, socialist ideology in the set in ascendance with the successful or political organization of the people to um, embrace and develop and entrench those ideas within society and within uh, the political system. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at Singapore, right, uh, the, we have become more conservative over time uh, because we also had a government which went the other way. And if you look at Singapore in the 60s, we were definitely far more socialist and enthusiastic about uh, social welfare than we are today. And we had greater expectation of our rights as individuals and our rights uh, collectively as a society uh, and the ability to demand those rights against government. So I think my point is that societies can be successfully transformed through government policy over time uh, it doesn't require an authoritarian government to do so, but requires a lot of work and political organization to build a consensus. Um, but that can be done and has been done. And we live in a time where as uh, neoliberal, the consensus, right? The neoliberal consensus is breaking down. And as opportunities are arising, as we enter a crisis, uh, of um, the ideologies that govern us, uh, we actually have a great opportunity to develop um, both an, an ideological response and a programmatic one, you know, a more concrete um, response to the challenges that we face, and then entrench that in our societies for decades to come. Uh, or as uh, to quote a, uh, a musical, I think all of you will know, uh, look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. Well, on that note, on that optimistic note, I think we will uh, join our hands, uh, physical or digital, to thank PJ uh, for your wonderful presentation and for being so generous um, and answering these questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, um, but we do have to wrap up. Um, that was just wonderful um, and really thank thought you. Thing. Thank you. And I will hand it back to G for some closing remarks, um, but, but thank you all and fantastic. Thank you so much, Ginny, for uh, you know moderating this discussion. I mean, there were some really terrific questions there, and it was so hard to decide. I'm sure as to which questions to ask, but I thought you know the questions that you actually selected actually hit on so many different aspects of uh, PJ's uh, presentation, and really, really made us think even harder about the ideas and the arguments that uh, PJ's asked us to think. And thank you so much, PJ, for this you know really terrific uh, presentation as well as for this uh, Q and A.
um, you know, if one thing, you know, I would definitely take away from this talk is the idea, of course, that, you know, the nation state is a product of the imagination. And so therefore, we are very capable uh, of reimagining it. All right. Uh, there is hope <laughs> in uh, that direction. Um, and I really do appreciate too, you know, PJ, that you do not wish to prescribe. I mean, it's, you know, we're all looking for an answer, isn't it? But really, you know, the answers are going to be various and they're going to be local and they will arise naturally out of organizing. Uh, I think that's also such an important message to take away as well. So thank you so much for your talk and thank you so much for all the work too that you do for a uh, new narrative. Uh, with new narrative. Uh, thank you, G. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Ginny, for moderating. And thank you, all of you, for coming and, and listening to me, especially those of you who woke up early in Singapore. Uh, it's it's not even 9 a.m. right now. So <laughs> thanks, everyone. Great. Now, with the uh, upcoming you know, presidential election in the U.S., uh, the fate of democracy, of course, is very much on our minds. Uh, PJ has said, you know, the votes is not the only thing, but still, it is a very important thing. So if you would like to help turn out the vote in the US, do check out these two organizations uh, in chat, which are mobilizing ordinary citizens to prevent uh, voter suppression and also to increase uh, turnout. All right, we really hope that you've enjoyed the event uh, tonight, brought to you by uh, Singapore Unbound. The next event, the launch of uh, Tanya De Rosario's hybrid memoir, And the Walls Come Crumbling Down, begins in 30 minutes. The link is given now in chat. So please join us at this very special launch event. The festival continues tomorrow and Saturday. You can check out the full festival program at the link in chat as well. And if you like what Singapore Unbound is doing for cultural exchange, freedom of expression, and equal rights, please consider making a generous donation at Fractured Atlas, our fiscal sponsor. We rely on champions like you to do the work that we do. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, this has been such an interesting and thought-provoking event, but we will say goodbye for now and hope you will join us again, all right, at another event at the festival. Good night and goodbye. <laughs>